All right. Thank you, Linda. Did you have a good lunch? Yes. All right. Got your attention back, some energy. <laughs> we can go at this again. <laughs> but only one more this time, not two. So we're on the home stretch. So um, let's just open with a word of prayer again. Our precious Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for yet another opportunity to share more information and good things and, and things about the herbs that you have grown uh, from the grounds for us and ways that we can utilize them and, and how to identify them and what to use them for. And I just pray that each one here will be able to uh, share this information with others as well as using it for themselves. Lord, may they be blessed and may they be a blessing. We invite your presence with us once again in this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So this one is on the wild herbs, poultices, baths, and salves. So when I made this lecture, my goal was to pick top five herbs that one could commonly be found in the wild across the U.S., so anywhere you go in the U.S., you should be able to find at least one or all of these, okay? So they're very common, and, and my reasoning for that was because, yeah, maybe now you could get some at the health food store or order them online, but what about when the day comes where you can't? And it's out in the wild for free, right? And so I'm going to show you how to identify them uh, and how to identify them as opposed to their poisonous lookalikes as well, because uh, identifying them is only half the battle, <laughs> right? If you're not sure that it's what you're looking for, um, you want to make sure that you know what that is. And the other thing was that not only could be commonly found across the wild, uh, the U.S. in the wild, but ones that would also do a number of different things and not just good for one or two things kind of thing. So each one of these, as you'll see as we go through and what's on your handout, each one of these is good for a number of things. And so on your handouts there, I have a, a ton of information, everything it's good for, when the best time to pick it is, what you would use fresh or dried, if you would pick it in the morning or in the spring or just that kind of thing, and also some online resources. So more information about each one of these herbs that you can do and look up and read on. And then at the bottom, some online resources for identification. In case you forget what I say, <laughs> um, you can go on line and say, what was that again? And so um, that is on there as well. And then all of the instructions as to how to make any of these herbs into a poultice or a bath or a salve, okay? So all of that is on there. And we're going to go ahead and, of course, what did I promise you? Same disclaimer every time, right? <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I get that out of there. Okay, so another quote for you from Medical Ministry says, God has caused to grow out of the ground herbs for the use of man. And if we understand the nature of these roots and herbs and make a right use of them, there would not be a necessity of running for the doctor so frequently and people would be in much better health than they are today. Isn't that a good quote? I love that. Not that we don't need no doctors, right? We need them. There's a time and there's a place for doctors. But we don't need them quite as frequently as people run to them today, right? There's some things that we can do at home um, to help ourselves. And so today we're going to be talking about these five herbs. Chickweed, comfrey, mullein, plantain, and yarrow. Now the plantain is not the banana. Okay, <laughs> that's what everyone thinks of. We're going to talk about bananas. What do you do? Um, or the banana looking thing. It is actually the herb plantain. So there, there's two different ones there. So as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about how to make these herbs into poultices. And you should all know very well by now what a poultice is, right? You watched me make a bunch of them. <laughs> okay, so we do the exact same thing just with an herb instead of with 
potatoes or ginger or charcoal or that kind of thing, okay? Baths, herbal baths can be useful for all kinds of things where you can just soak in an infusion of herbs in your tub and uh, help that get that into your system, help with skin conditions, just all sorts of things for herbal baths and herbal salves. Um, this is uh, become a new favorite of mine in making salves. And it's something that is quick and easy that you can just rub on to you for all kinds of things. And um, it's a blessing to be able to have the knowledge to know how to make it because you can make a salve, an herbal salve for yourself at home at a far cheaper cost than what it is to buy it at the store. Um, if you want to trade your time for making it, right? So it, they're fun to make. They're easy to make. It's just the knowledge of how you would do it. So we're going to go over those at the end, but I'm going to go through all five of the herbs, what they're used for, what they're good for, how to identify them and all that. And then we're going to talk about the poultices, baths, and salves. Okay. So we're going to talk first about chickweed. I go alphabetically because I'm just OCD like that. <laughs> so we're starting with chickweed. Um, chickweed, you can see it's used for all kinds of things and that's basically how you're going to see each one of these er herbs. Chickweed is used for abscesses, for rheumatic arthritis. It's an astringent uh, used for benign cysts, for boils. Again, I, what was it that other one that was used for boils? Onions, 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 yep. So you can also use chickweed, good for boils. Uh, dermatitis, for drawing out splinters. Potato is also used for drawing out splinters. It does that drawing. Um, insect stingers, those kinds of things, pulling those out. And eczema, eye irritations and infections for hives, itching, nerve pain of surface nerves, used for shingles, because that's a, a nerve pain, skin burns and rashes, for swollen lymph nodes, for varicose veins and wounds. So chickweed does a lot of stuff, doesn't it? Yes, a lot of good stuff there. And so this is something, chickweed is only found in the early spring. It grows very low to the ground and it's a, a very small white flower. You can see a little picture of it there. Um, now, how are you going to identify it? It does have a poisonous look-alike, and that is, let's go here, scarlet pimpernel. Now, scarlet pimpernel is poisonous in large quantities. If you get a little bit of it, it's, it's not going to do you harm. But if both of these don't have their flowers on them, these are the le leaves. Can you tell me which one is chickweed and which one is scarlet pimpernel? <laughs> yeah, that one's getting, yeah, so the someone observant it, it's getting a little blossom. All right, so if they're, the veins do look different, but if you didn't see them side by side in the wild, how would you know, right? Exactly. But there is a way to tell without the flowers which one is which, okay? So chickweed, the flower and the stems. Chickweed, like I said, is these tiny little white flowers and they actually have five petals. Looks like 10, doesn't it, yeah. right? That's because the petals are very deeply clefted. But if you look close enough, you see it's connected at the bottom, right? So that's one petal, okay? That's one petal. So there's five deeply clefted petals and they're tiny white flowers, very delicate. The stem, if you gently break the stem open, there's a stretchy cord inside, like elastic, then Scarlet Pimpernel does not have that. If you break it and there's no stretchy cord inside, that's not chickweed, okay? So you've got that little stretchy cord. And then also on the stem, there is some hair, 
but the hair doesn't cover the whole stem. It grows in a single line, okay? And it's a little fine hair, grows in a single line, and then when that, um, when there's a new notch where the leaves come out, new notch, that row of hairs turns a quarter stem. Okay, so it changes direction. And that's why you don't see hairs on this part of it because the line of hairs is now behind the stem. And then at the next notch, it turns again a quarter of a stem and it'll be on the side. And then the next notch, it'll turn and it'll be in the front. So chickweed just has that single line of fine hairs, okay? So we've got the five petals deeply clefted. We've got the stretchy cord in the center of the stem. And we've got that single line of hairs growing instead of covering the whole stem. So scarlet pimpernel, you can see obviously the flowers are very different. So if they're in bloom, there's no question as to what's what, right? All right, but the stems and the leaves, you'll see that the stems do not have any hairs at all. And the stems are also, instead of being round, if you look at the stem of a scarlet pimpernel downward, there's four ridges, so it looks kind of square, okay? So I don't know if you can kind of see the ridge on this left side. There's a ridge out there. Well, it's got four of those ridges, okay? So no hair and four ridges. And then the leaves underneath of Scarlet Pimpernel have little black dots, okay? So if you remember those things and you go back to this here, how are you going to tell which one is which? Right? You can check the stems, break a stem off and see if it's got the stretchy cord. And you can look under the leaf and see if it's got black dots or not. Right? Right. And you can see if it has that one line of hair along the stem. All right? So that's how you can identify the chickweed versus the scarlet pimpernel. Okay? When it doesn't have flowers, obviously. All right. So comfrey. Comfrey is used for, again, all kinds of things. And this is something that we are using a lot at New Start. And we're, we're making salves with it. Uh, we've done poultices. Comfrey is fascinating. It's an antibacterial, anti-inflammatory. It helps arthritis and back pain, broken and fractured bones. Actually, um, one of the nicknames of comfrey is knit bone because it helps to knit bones back together, broken or fractured. And that is because it has a lantoin in it, and that's a compound that generates new cell growth. And so it helps uh, uh, regenerate that cell growth so that it heals and knits back together more quickly. So broken and fractured bones, um, bruises, burns, decreases pain and swelling in joints and muscles. Um, it's used for eczema and for gout, for ligament and tendon injuries, again, because of that allantoin in it that helps with knitting things back together. Psoriasis, rashes, so a lot of skin stuff going on here, eczema, psoriasis, rash, sprains and strains, ulcers, varicose veins and wounds only if there's no infection present and the reason for that is because if you've got an infection down inside comfrey is so powerful that allantoin is so powerful that it can heal the skin on the surface before the inside is healed and so if there's infection in there it's going to then um, seal that infection inside okay so that's why you don't want to use it on a wound that has infection. That's got to heal from the inside out. All right. So comfrey does have a poisonous look-alike, and that is foxglove. <coughs> now, do any of you know either comfrey or foxglove? Your grandma used to grow them? 
Okay. Comfrey, that one. Okay. Yes. Foxglove, exactly. She said she's heard it can be hard on the heart. They actually make medication. Uh, digit, uh, was it digitalis? Is from the foxglove because of how it affects the heart. And if you don't have a uh, specific heart condition that needs that, then you don't want to be taking foxglove <laughs> um, because that will uh, negatively impact you. So I had someone say that Comfrey is on the right. How many uh, of you agree? Uh, on the right. Two. No questions. <laughs> uh huh. About Comfrey? Oh well, we don't have time for that. Okay. More jagged. More poisonous. Okay. Interesting. So how many of you say that foxglove is on the left? Yes. So yeah, he goes with that. And that's true. That's exactly right. So it's comfrey on the right and foxglove on the left. But how are you going to identify that if they're not side by side? Can you tell a difference? No, don't try them. <laughs> Serrated edge. Exactly right. So foxglove has the toothed edge on the leaves there, the little teeth, and comfrey is more smooth, right? So also, how do you tell by the flowers? Can you tell me which one is which? Oh, so one's more on a stalk. The foxglove's on a stalk. Is that, is that definitely on the right? Yeah. The one is foxglove and one is comfrey. That's not devil's back, okay. Uh-uh. Who says that comfrey's on the right? Who says that foxglove is on the left? Oh, you guys just aren't saying anything. <laughs> you just got it. Foxglove is on the right. Exactly. And comfrey is on the left. So, they grow very differently, as you can see kind of blurred in the background. Foxglove does grow on a tall stem, okay, on a stalk. And it's, it, the shape of the flowers are different. They are like little bells that drop down all along that stalk, right? Comfrey, on the other hand, doesn't grow on a tall stalk. It grows in little clumps, okay? And its shape is more like a, a dress, if you think of a dress that poofs out yeah. at the bottom kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and... They can both come in different colors. I just picked the same color so that it would look, you know, as similar as possible. But you can get comfrey and foxglove in different colored flowers. You can see some yellow foxglove in the background there. Um, so you can get some blue or purple comfrey and that kind of thing. So, again, foxglove, they grow drop-down bells on a tall stalk. And comfrey grows in little clumps. Uh, with the little dressed shaped flowers, okay? So there they are together. The leaves with the flowers uh, on both of them. So remember how comfrey is it does not have teeth on the leaves, okay? So it, it's the poison that has teeth, all right? <laughs> You're going to remember that. It's the poison that's got teeth. It'll bite you, <laughs> all right? Um, is comfrey a little bit toxic also? Good question. Thank you for reminding me about that. Some people do wonder, and some people will say you cannot take comfrey internally, um, only externally. There is a, a component in it that can be if you get too much of it, yes. Um, but some people will use like a cup of tea, you know, sort of thing. You're not going to drink a gallon throughout the day of it, you know, just one cup or something like that. Some people will shred a little bit up and put it into a salad, um, that kind of thing, because they're wanting to get the elantuin internally to help with regenerating new cell growth 
uh, for certain issues and stuff. But in, for the most part, comfrey is used uh, more so externally uh, because of that. You just can't get too much internally. All right. So, all right. Mullen. So, mullen is good for all kinds of things, too. Isn't this great? And it's all on your handout, so you don't have to try to memorize all this. <laughs> it's antibacterial, especially the flowers. It's anti-inflammatory, antiseptic, antispasmodic, antiviral. It's like anti-everything, right? <laughs> anti, 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 anti. Um, it's also an astringent. It's good for burns and bursitis as a disinfectant. It also draws out splinters. Um, so now we've got three things that do that. Potatoes, right? Yeah. Chickweed and mullen. Ear aches and infections. So now you can do onions or mullen, <laughs> or you can bind the two. Uh, good for eczema and gout, hair growth stimulation, hemorrhoids, inflamed eyelids, insect bites, muscle cramps and spasms, skin abrasions, sunburns. Cabbage was also good for sunburns. Toilet paper, you can use it like toilet, the leaves, like toilet paper is called, it's, it's called the uh, camper's toilet paper because they're so soft. They're very hairy and velvety, but, 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 the thing you want to be mindful of, quiet please, the thing you want to be mindful of is that where you break the leaf off of the stalk, um, you don't want that close to where you're wiping, all right? Because you don't want any of those fine little hairs getting in you, <laughs> okay? So you use the outer end of it as your toilet paper and um, it actually can work quite well. Uh, also can be used for tumors and ulcers, for warts using the uh, uh, root powder, and for wounds. Pretty much all of these can be used for wounds, so you can use it individually or you can combine them again uh, and make a, a wound, herbal wound combination. So mullen is a, a very useful herb you can see there, that's a large uh, growth of it. That is in its second year. When it's in the first year, it's just a rosette and it has no tall stalk. And in the second year, it gets its tall stalk with flowers, okay? So that is how you can tell foxglove is also the poisonous lookalike to mullen. So mullen, comfrey, and foxglove look very similar, okay? So we've already figured out how to identify foxglove, so you should all be able to tell me which one is which. What side is foxglove? Do you all agree? Yeah, it's got the teeth, right? <laughs> it's got the teeth on the edge. And um, mullen there is uh, more smoother on the edges. It is also a little more grayish green, but again, if it's not side by side, how are you gonna tell? So you can't just go by that. Mullen is also more hairy, but foxglove is hairy too, so you can't go by that either. So you can tell by the uh, teeth on the edge. And then in the second ear, you can tell by, they both have tall stalks, but the flowers are very different, very different. So it, there's no bells going on in mullen, okay? It's just these little yellow flowers um, that will grow there, and that's what's good for the antibacterial. And sometimes it's just the tip of the stalk. Sometimes it'll just be at the top portion there, or sometimes it'll be a longer top portion that's got the flowers growing on it. Um, but you can, and again, usually mullen is yellow flowers, but again, foxglove can be a, a variety of different colors, okay? So you've got your uh, teeth on the leaves and you've got your dropped bell flowers for foxglove and you've got smoother, hairier, more silvery leaves with tiny little yellow flowers at the top of the stalk. All right, that is mullen. 
plantain. So now this is what is not the banana, okay? You never knew that another type of plantain existed <laughs> until today, all right? So plantain, this is the herb plantain, and there's no fruit to it. There's not even flowers. There's just leaves and seeds, okay? And it's the plantain, the plantago family, that the psyllium husk comes from. That's what I used to thicken the charcoal poultice that I made in the baggie, was the psyllium husk powder. So that comes from the plantago ovata family. Um, the two most common plantains are the plantago major and plantago lanceolata. And that's what I'm going to be showing you today. Um, because this is what is most commonly found, uh, again, just out in the wilds. And when I learned this, you know, I start looking around everywhere I walk at Weimar. What can I find and what can I identify? I found the narrow leaf, which is the plantago lanceolata. That's the narrow leaf plantain everywhere. I mean, I couldn't go anywhere without seeing it. <laughs> and I was trying like, well, where's the broad leaf? That's the Plantago uh, major. And I found a little bit of it, uh, but boy, the narrow leaf was just everywhere. So these, again, these uses for plantain is, again, not the banana, <laughs> anti-inflammatory, astringent, burns, hemorrhoids, itching from oral mucositis, uh, which can be a, a side effect from radiation and uh, chemotherapy, pain and or itch from insect bites and stings, poison ivy and poison oak, rashes, snake bites, sores, swollen lymph glands, tooth aches and wounds. So you can see there's some crossover in these. Some of them all kind of do the same thing, but yet they have different things that they do as well. And so if you can't find one that can do it, you might have a, a different herb in your area in the wild that can. So we're going to, now the poisonous look alike. This is the broadleaf plantain, a picture of it there, but I'm gonna show you a little bit closer up um, the poisonous look like to plantain is some certain lilies because their leaves can look similar. But really, the only way to identify them between is you just have to wait for the flower to come on. Plantains do not have flowers, like I mentioned. So if it looks like a plantain leaf, but it's got a flower on it, that's more the lily that you're looking at. <laughs> and not the plantain, okay? So how would you identify? Here you can see there's the young and the mature uh, broadleaf plantain. So <coughs> the leaves, the veins, are very distinctive uh, on plantain in the sense that the vein on a lot of leaves, there's one vein that goes up the center and then veins that go off the sides from that, right? Plantain does not do that. The vein goes from the base all the way out to the edge of the leaf. And the next vein goes from the base to the edge of the leaf. And the next one from the base to the edge of the leaf. Can you see that? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And you can really tell that. So it's, it's not a center vein and all going off. They're each their own separate vein uh, originating at the base. Okay? And that goes for the, the broad leaf and the narrow leaf. So for the seed pod, that's what you see on the mature one is that s little stem or stalk going up. And that's the seed pod. And that is what um, on the broad leaf plantain, the seed pod will be quite long on there. And some people will eat those raw and some people will roast those and they say it tastes like popcorn. I haven't tried it, but I would like to sometime. That would be interesting. But it's um, very fibrous. So, you know, don't eat too many of those or, or you're going to be creating a situation here. <laughs> right? Okay. And then there's all the different parts. Yeah, the seed pod. Because it's very fibrous. That's what the um, psyllium husks come from on a different, uh, the plantago ovata 
is from the seed pod and that is what thickened up. That's what that fiber is. Okay, so the narrow leaf, again, um, the broad leaf is, is just what it sounds like. It's a broader leaf and the narrow leaf is more of a uh, thinner, more narrow, but the same thing. The vein goes from the base out to the edge of the leaf. And they're all separate. And usually there's five to seven veins or so per leaf, somewhere like that. And on the mature one, these seed pods are different. They're, they have a taller stalk with just a little bloop seed part at the top of it, okay? And um, that is what is all over the place at Weimar. <laughs> just all over the place. And, and everywhere you go, you, you can't go anywhere without seeing it um, during the spring and summer, that is. And so, you know, yes, it has little flowers, but they're teeny, teeny, tiny little things that you don't notice. You just more see the, the seed pods. So it's the leaves of the broad leaf and the narrow leaf that is so medicinal for all those things that we just uh, mentioned. Uh, there on the previous slide in things that you can use plantain for. And it's something where you can, uh, the uh, camper's poultice, they call it, you can take a leaf of plantain and chew it up in your mouth and stick it on an insect bite or a wound or something like that. Uh, it's called, you know, the camper's poultice. You're out in the woods and you come across, you know, something happened, bit you, or you, you hurt yourself on something. Just chew that up, get the juices of the plantain getting released, and then put it on you. And you can use another leaf to kind of bind it there, um, depending on where it's at in the body. But you can use that as your bandaging as well to hold it in place. Um, things like that. You can also do that with uh, other herbs, but it's most commonly in the plantain. Does that work for the narrow one and the other one? Yes, for the narrow and the broadleaf. Mm -hmm. All right, yarrow. Yarrow is excellent um, as well. It's used for abscesses as an antispasmodic, antibacterial, antifungal, anti-inflammatory. It's also good for mild asthma or bronchitis if you do like a steam inhalation with it. Boil some water, add some yarrow to it, and be breathing that in. That's a steam inhalation. Um, it's used for bleeding because it helps uh, to clot. And so you can stop bleeding with yarrow. It's good for boils. Here's something else for boils, right? And for bruises, for burns eczema, hay fever, again by doing that steam inhalation with it, uh, hemorrhoids, hives, joint inflammation, mastitis, poison ivy, sores, sprains, swelling, and wounds. So all five of these are good for wounds, but yarrow is a, especially a good one for wounds as well. Um, of all of these five herbs, yarrow is the one that has the most serious poisonous look-alike. It could kill you, okay? So this, we're going to take a little bit more time on. Hemlock. Now there's water hemlock and poison hemlock, and actually water hemlock is the most deadly. Um, but if you didn't know, I mean, do you know which one is which? They'd look a little bit different. If you didn't see them side by side and you knew that one of them could kill you, would you want to chance that, take that risk? Uh-uh. Uh-uh. If you don't know 100% sure that you know it is yarrow, then don't touch it, okay? And I mean literally don't touch it because even the touching of it can get the poison of the hemlock on you and uh, be a problem. Okay, so who says that yarrow is on the right? Who says that hemlock is on the right? Okay, there's more that say that. That's right, hemlock is on the right. That's hemlock, and this one over here is yarrow. But how are we going to identify that um, not going by the flowers? 
We're going to identify it by the leaves and the stems, okay? So here's the flowers of all three. Um, and you can see the water hemlock and poison hemlock look pretty similar. A and they're different than the yarrow, but even at a distance, they all look the same. They all look the same. But you can see how the yarrow has a little more solid of a flower, but it's a little white flower. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we're going to identify it by the leaves and the stem. Thank the Lord, he made the leaves very different on all of them and the stems as well. So for the yarrow, these leaves, now these are all very close up, um, but these leaves are little. They're tiny little things. So they're very light and feathery and ferny uh, type of thing and it's just got these little things off of that one center stem, okay? And that's a yarrow. Water hemlock, it's got these leaves that are d deeply toothed, okay? And the vein off of each one of those goes in between each tooth. Can you see that? Okay, so that is water hemlock. That's the most poisonous, all right? So you identify these with your eyes, okay? Not with anything else. Yes, that's what I mean by toothed. Yeah, toothed, uh-huh, serrated. That's a good word for it, serrated. And those veins come between each one of the serrations. Okay, and the poison hemlock, um, it's a ferny type of leaf, but it's like a little fern, a bunch of little ferns off of a center uh, vine there, center stem, right? So very different leaves. All you have to know is how to recognize yarrow, and then if you see something else, you know it's not yarrow, right? Okay, the stems are also very different. So the yarrow stem is um, solid green. There's no other coloration to it, and it has a very, very fine hair on it, okay? You can even barely see it. You can see it a little bit up there, but just very fine hair, and you can see the leaves there. Water hemlock, on the other hand, part of the stem will be green and part might have this uh, purpley reddish color, but it would be solid, okay? And that can be more up uh, above the part that's in the ground, but that is the water hemlock. And so yarrow is never going to have a reddish purple color, okay? It's just solid green. Poison hemlock, it it will have portions of the stem, not the whole thing, but portions that can have this splotchy, purpley, reddish color on it. And they actually call that Socrates' blood because Socrates, he was sentenced to die, and he chose to die by drinking the poison hemlock tea. And so the, they then um, came up with calling those splotches Socrates' blood. So if you see those speckles on there, you know that's poison, okay? That's blood. So any of that uh, discoloration is the uh, hemlock, and you're not going to see that on yarrow, all right? So again, you identify by your eyes, right? You don't need to touch anything. It's, it's pretty obvious visually, the differences, okay? All right, so those are the five herbs. Now, how would you use them, any of them? You can make any of them into poultices or baths or salves, all right? So these instructions are on your handouts as well. For an herbal poultice, you should have a good idea how to make an herbal poultice by now, right? <laughs> so you're, you're basically, you're just going to get your fresh leaves, and you're gonna either cut them into strips or tear them in places, uh, pieces or put them in a blender, or you can even crush them in a mortal and pestle kind of thing. It's just the idea is to get it releasing its juices, its good stuff. That's where the medicine is, okay? So you gotta get it uh, crushed or cut or bruised or something like that, all right? And then once you have that um, uh, nicely mashed up, 
And you can, if you're going to blend it, you might need to add just a little bit of water. But you wouldn't want to add much because you don't want to dilute it down, right? And you don't want it soupy. You want it to be thick, okay? Um, so that's only if you're blending it. And then you're going to pour that mixture onto the center of a cloth or a paper towel, right? So say I, I blended up some comfrey leaves, all right? And then I'm going to scrape that out from the blender and put it in the center of this paper towel. And I'm going to do the same thing that I did on the other ones. I'm going to fold all four edges over and contain that into a little pouch. And that's going to go on the skin, okay? Right there, boom. So we're going to get our folded piece of plastic, same as before, put that over it and wrap that on. And there's our herbal poultice, okay? Um, not rocket science, very simple and uh, quick and easy to do. And something, if you've got, you know, off of a comfrey plant, you can pick a whole bunch of leaves and you can blend the whole thing up and make up a whole bunch of these poultices and then put them on a cookie sheet stick them in the freezer, and when they're frozen, you can then plop, plop, plop them into a freezer bag and then have them in your freezer ready to just grab out as you need. And you don't have to make it fresh every time. It's just a, a quick and easy way uh, to do that uh, up, and it, it works very well. No, because the freezer preserves it well. If it sat in the fridge, it would lose its potency, yes, but not in the freezer. So you're going to there, you know, apply it, fold that. You're going to wear it for several hours or overnight. Um, anything you wear overnight, just make sure all the edges are well sealed and it's well wrapped up. So again, you're not making a mess in your bed <laughs> and staining things and having them fall off and and making an irritation out of this and like, Ugh, I don't want to do that again. That was such a pain, right? And so uh, be wise about it. And um, like I said, you can make them up ahead of time. If you're going to be using them, um, like if you need a couple more that day, you can put that in the fridge. But if you're not going to be using it up quickly, then store it in the freezer, okay? How long can you store it then in the refrigerator? In the refrigerator, it would just be that day. That day. Yeah, I would keep it fresh that day. Um, but the freezer, it wouldn't matter as much, all right? So... That's uh, simply an herbal poultice, and that can be used for any of those issues that we said those herbs were used for, uh, any of those, except the ones that were for steam inhalation type of thing, you know. Okay, so an herbal bath. An herbal bath is very uh, simple to make. You can do it a couple of different ways. You can make some tea, I call it an infusion, herbal infusion, into a couple of quart jars. Um, fill them up with some hot water. Bo boil some water. Put your herb of choice in there um, or your combination of herbs and put the boiling water over that and let that steep for at least 30 minutes or you could let it steep for a few hours uh, to make a nice strong potency. And then you're going to fill your bathtub with your hot water and you're just going to then take your herbal mixture and uh, strain it out and let all that infusion and that tea go into your bathtub and you get in there and you take your herbal bath okay if you don't want to have to go to the bother of straining it out you can put all your herbs into these little muslin bags and then you can set that into the jar of boiled water and let that infuse again for the same amount of time. And then simply take that baggie out, dump that water in your bathtub and dump this into your bath water and just let it continue sitting in there as you're in the tub with it, right? So you would do a couple of quarts that way. Or if you don't even wanna do it that way, <laughs> You can simply use the baggie, fill it with your herbs, and I would say of this size, I would use two or three of these, and then hang it over the faucet and have the hot water 
that's filling the tub running through these baggies and that will infuse it into your bath water and then once the tub is full take it off drop that in your bath and take your herbal bath okay yeah so you're gonna soak uh, usually at a minimum of 10 minutes uh, at least you can soak for a lot longer than that if you want to but no less than 10 minutes to be able to get a good uh, benefit from it oh these are just dried herbs Um, you can have like a cup of of herb into each quart. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. A, about that. And because it's a bathtub, it's a lot of water, yeah. right? So you're gonna need, you know, a teaspoon of herbs. Not gonna <laughs> cut it. <laughs> You've got to have that. The skin issues, the eczema, psoriasis, rashes, those skin things, right? Well, if they don't have a bathtub, then you can't do it. <laughs> so you'll have to do either a poultice or um, a salve. <laughs> so you can also add um, Epsom salt to your bath. You can add essential oils to make it smell a little more pleasant instead of herby. <laughs> Some people don't like that herby smell. It smells like grass, whatever. Okay, add some lavender or peppermint or lemongrass in there or something. You can do that as well, either with essential oils or with getting those herbs and having that in with your medicinal herbs. Um, and that's simply it. You just don't want all the dried or fresh herb in the bath water because then when you drain it, you don't want to be clogging up your piping, okay? So that's why you make a tea infusion with it and or you have it contained in the baggie so that it's not going to be clogging up your pipes uh, with the herbs. Okay. All right. Herbal salves. Now this one is the one that takes the most work, but it is um, very rewarding because a salve will last you a long time and you can take it with you traveling and it's just kind of an instant go-to. You don't have to make a poultice or you don't have to uh, infuse the tea for the baths or things like that. Um, it's just there and made and you get what you need, put it on and there you've got it. Um, a salve is basically um, an herb infused into oil, and then you melt some beeswax and add that herbal oil to the beeswax, and then pour that into a jar, and that once that's cooled, it's thickened up, and there's your salve, okay? So for infusing the oil, there's different methods of doing it. Um, the one that I like the most is the cold infusion, just because there's no additional heat uh, to the oil. So uh, when you do the cold infusion, the only time the oil gets heated is when you're adding it to the melted beeswax, and that's it. So it doesn't get too hot. But the way to infuse uh, cold infusion of an herb is, let's say I'm taking this yarrow, and I'm going to fill a quart jar about halfway to two-thirds full, okay, of the dried herb. And then I'm going to fill the whole quart jar with some extra virgin olive oil. That's what I like to use, extra virgin olive oil. And you're going to kind of get a knife and make sure that that oil has gotten down into all the herb. Uh, okay, so that all of that's surrounded and soaked with the oil. And if not, you, you know, you poke it down in there, make sure the oil is all in the herb and your oil m level might drop. So then you add some more oil until it's full, the quart jar is full, okay? Then you're going to set that jar in a dark place. You don't want it in any direct light. But I found that if I set it into a cabinet or a cupboard, I forget about it. 
and you're supposed to shake it every day. So what I do is I have a, a room that is out of the, there's a corner of it that's out of direct light, but I walk by it every day because I have to pass that way to go to the bathroom. And I see it sitting there. And so I'll just, when I see it, I'll grab it, you shake it a few times, you set it back on the counter, and you do that once a day. You just have to shake it once a day. And you do that for four to eight weeks, okay? So it's not hard to do. Dump some herb in there, dump oil in there, and shake it once a day. And if it's somewhere where you're uh, easily passing every day and see it, you're not gonna miss it, right? So after that four to eight weeks, then all that, uh, the properties of the herb are infused into that olive oil and you're ready to make salve, okay? So very minimal work uh, for making your infused oil. Now, when you're done with that and you want to strain that herb out, I get a fine mesh strainer and then I put a cheesecloth in it, okay? And you put that over a bowl, usually a deeper bowl, but, and you're going to drain that out into the cheesecloth and you're gonna fold that and you're gonna squeeze that oil out of that, uh, of the herbs, okay? And then you're gonna throw the herbs away. And this that's left in the bowl, this is now your pure uh, oil herbal infusion, okay? So this is ready to make the salve. So for the salve, and what I like to do, actually, is I've, I've taken that away. I make sure there's no herbal pieces in here. And I then drain, strain that again, making sure that, you know, in case any pieces fell into the oil on the sides, I'll strain it a second time back into the jar uh, that's cleaned out. And now I'm ready. I can either immediately make my salve, or I can put that in the cupboard. I'm gonna put the name, what it is, the date, and all of that, um, so that I can remember. And that's ready for me to grab when I wanna make some salve, okay? Now you can, you don't have to make it into salve. You can simply then use, uh, rub that herbal oil into you instead of making it into a salve. And it's gonna have all that same medicinal benefit. The, the, the only reason that you like to make, people like to make a salve is because it thickens it, so to speak, and uh, it makes it more like a cream, and it do, it's not as messy as using an oil, okay? And it makes a really good gift. You can give these bottles of salve. No questions, remember? Save your questions for the end. <laughs> it does not erase wrinkles, no. <laughs> so you're going to get some beeswax and you can get it in blocks or you can get it in beads or shreds, that kind of thing. Uh, I recommend the beads or the shreds because uh, blocks, you, it's very hard to cut into pieces. Ask me how I know. <laughs> it's, um, it, it's not worth it. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. So if you've got the beads or the sh uh, shreds, you can easily measure that. So you wanna have a little kitchen scale, and I forgot to grab my kitchen scale yesterday. But you're gonna measure out one ounce of beeswax to one cup of oil, okay? So like this, this is a one cup measure right there. So I have a bigger one at home that's a two cup. So I could melt two ounces of beeswax and do two cups of oil and get it done twice as fast, right? So you're gonna measure out your one ounce of beeswax and you want good quality. And then you're gonna put that into uh, the way I like to do it. You can use a double boiler uh, the same way or you can use this method of putting it into a glass cup and then you have a pan of boiling water there and you put that glass cup into the boiling water. 
that's only about half full because you don't want any of that water getting into the uh, cup, all right? So no water in your beeswax. Um, and you just let that melt. And then once that's melted, you're then going to take your herbal infused oil and you're going to fill that up into that one cup uh, level. And when you add the oil, some of the beeswax kind of rehardens a little bit, so you have to wait uh, and let it remelt. Um, but it doesn't take too long, and you can tell it's melted by when it the oil turns clear, because when the beeswax is hardened, it's uh, a solid color in there. It's white, and so you won't see any more pieces of wax floating around. And then. All you're gonna do is you're gonna take your jar, either a dark glass uh, jar, because again, you wanna protect it from the light and you don't want plastic, or you can get these little tins as well and make salves in them. And once that's all melted, you're going to then simply pour that salve into your jars, however many you have, and you're going to let them cool. Um, a four ounce size like this takes about 24 hours to cool. You want it the, to cool to the center or to the core, okay? Um, because you don't want to be putting a lid on it and then having the heat in there and it's gonna create moisture. Um, if you have moisture in your salve, it's going to cause it to go rancid uh, much more quickly. But salves will last um, at, at least a good year. And uh, so once you have it, it ha has set and cooled, this might only take 12 hours. It's a lot smaller, so it's gonna cool faster. If it's an eight ounce jar, it's gonna take longer, you know, so you've got the idea. Once it has thoroughly cooled, you can then put the lid on it and you label it, what the name of it is, everything it contains, and the date. And there you go, you've got your salve. Now you can uh, store them in the cupboard, but they will last even longer if you keep them in the fridge uh, because it is an oil. But you can store it in the fridge and then take it with you on trips because it doesn't have to be refrigerated, right? Um, so it can go with you camping, it can go with you hiking, it can go with you on mission trips, it can go with you anywhere um, that you can take that. But the important aspect is always date it. You need to always date it. And you may think, oh, I'll remember what's in there. Uh-uh-uh, you write it down. <laughs> um, put that in there. Something that you can do before you pour it out into your jars, I forgot to mention, is once all your stuff is melted and everything, at the very end, you take this out of the heat and you can add some essential oils in there if you want to, make it smell better because this is gonna smell like olive oil, okay? And some people don't mind that, that's fine. But if you want it to smell like lavender or peppermint or uh, wild orange or something, you know, a little more happy, you can add those uh, in there as well. And they also have a medicinal effect uh, for it. You know, peppermint is gonna have a nice cooling effect and that can help do put that in with comfrey, which is anti-inflammatory, right? So that cooling and the anti-inflammatory aspect. Um, lavender has tremendous amounts of benefits uh, for all kinds of things. It's not just for calming. That's what people most commonly know it for. But lavender can help with burns and wounds and just a, a, a ton of different things and rashes. Um, and so it's, it's a good option for in your salves. So again, it's just infusing the herb into the oil, straining the herb out, melting some beeswax, add your oil to it, and then pour it into your jars, and there you've got your salve, okay? So it, it kind of sounds a little complicated, but it's, it's really simple to do, nothing's hard. The hardest thing is cleaning what had the beeswax, okay? And I see some nods like, yes. <laughs> so some people will have um, utensils just dedicated to salve making. 
and that way they don't have to worry about ruining their other pots or pans or utensils or things with the beeswax. Um, I personally, I don't, I live in a small space and so I don't have space to have double stuff. And so what I do is, because I've used the number of different things for um, making salve and I've, when I had to chop the blocks of wax, oh, that made such a mess and my knife was all uh, coated with wax and my plate that I was cutting it on and it's just a regular eating plate and I'm like, how am I gonna get this off of there? <laughs> And I tried to grate the wax and oh, that didn't work, but now I've got wax on my grater. And <laughs> so all you have to do is boil some water. I filled up my teapot and boiled it. And then I went outside and I took my stuff, went outside and just poured that boiling water all uh, in the, over the utensil, in the pot, whatever it was and poured that in there and, to, and dumped it out until I could tell that there wasn't any more wax in there. And then had paper towel and wiped it out. And if there's any wax in there, you'll feel it when you wipe it. And then if there is, then you would pour some more boiling water over it and melt that wax, get it out. So it's not hard to do, it's just you do have to be careful with handling that boiling water that you don't burn yourself. But that's how I've cleaned all my utensils. Um, some people say once beeswax is on it, it's, it's ruined. You can't use it for anything else. No, it's not. Just pour some boiling water on it. <laughs> you'll get your pot back or you'll get your utensil back. It's okay. It's all food grade beeswax. It's all food grade beeswax, yes. Um, so it's not a problem. No, you can't cool it off, com good question. You can't cool it off completely before putting essential oils in because your beeswax is gonna start hardening. So you have to put it in when the beeswax is melted. Yeah, yes, but it'll start getting solid, but you have to remove it from the heat. Yeah. And you can let it cool like a minute and kind of stir it, but then you need to add your essential oil into it and pour it into your jars, okay? A minute, yeah, it's not much, not much, because the beeswax starts hardening pretty quickly. So I think, did I miss any of the steps here? Let's see, uh-huh. All right, I got all of those, and this is the last of it. Mm-hmm. Oh yes, so not only that you could add um, some essential oil, but you can also add some vitamin E oil uh, to help preserve it even longer. So um, you can do essential oil and or vitamin E oil as a preservative. Try to get the, the as pure vitamin E oil as possible, not one that's diluted down with other oils. Um, no, olive oil, that's what the herbs are infused into. That's not a preservative. All right, so it's the vitamin E that's a preservative. I don't understand how you took that, put the beeswax into the glass measuring cup, how you, you're trying to melt the beeswax? Yes, you're melting the beeswax. So you measure your beeswax out, you get your one ounce per cup of oil, and then you put that one ounce into the cup, that you then put into the boiling water. And in the hot water, it's like a double boiler type situation. And that heat will gradually melt it. Yes. So, there you go. We got all of that. All right. So, questions. Yes, so then once your beeswax is melted, you then take your infused oil and you pour that in up into that one cup line and it remelts the beeswax. I had that one first. So where do you get the flowers back though? Where do you get all of that? Flowers to make it. The herbs? Yeah. So if you're not gonna go find them in the wild, um, health food stores. 
or ordering them online. A lot of, not all health food stores do, but um, even if they uh, carry a few herbs, that means they order from a company that supplies herbs. So if they don't have the ones that you want, then you can ask them, could you order me a pound of yarrow, say, for example. Oh yeah, you can order them online very easily. Yes, yes, Amazon. Okay, there was hands in the back. Yes. <laughs> and that, um, so as soon as you um, heat stinging nettle, it neutralizes the sting. Mm hmm Uh-huh. Right. And you do have to harvest it, you know, carefully with uh, protection on your hands and things. But there's a lot of uses for stinging nettle. And those are actually the herbs that um, I want to create at my second herbal lecture on. And it's on those because those are my, these are my top five and those are my next top ones. Yes. Is it possible to use castor oil to infuse the herbs? That's a good question. Yes, it is. Um, something that you can do is actually use castor oil as a catalyst to help drive the herb deeper into the tissues. You don't necessarily have to make a salve with it. What you do is infuse the herb into it and then use that oil, infused oil, and it'll drive, because castor oil goes the deepest, it'll drive the herb deep into you. Yeah, all right, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, you can grow them for sure. Um, can you grow them in pots in your yard? Uh, yes, you can. And some of them you would want to, like comfrey. If it's not contained, it's going to take over, kind of thing. And so you would want to grow that in like a, a, ha a half wine barrel kind of thing. Um, but yes, you can grow them on your own. Uh, as well as finding them in the wild. And where would you get them if you wanted to grow? Find them in the wild. <laughs> and then start growing them. But they, you can, um, it, they're hard to find fresh, like in a store. Nurseries and stuff don't tend to have the herbs like they do the flowers and bushes and things like that. So that's harder to find. The beeswax, uh-huh. Yeah, well, again, that's more in a health food store or ordering it online. Yes. Mm -hmm. No, it's the wax, and it needs to be purified. It, you don't want any of the, the honey in it. Yeah, you're wanting it. Yeah. Yeah, beeswax. For that. All right. Any other questions? Um, I have out in my little entrance area, there's that narrow leaf plantain. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure I have chickweed. Chickweed was already gone by the time I uh, started really knowing how to identify it. So I'm going to have to wait for this spring uh, to be able to identify that. But I took all the, uh, I gave this lecture at New Start in June for a retreat that we had. And the next day I took them out onto the trails and I scouted it out beforehand, but I took them out onto the trails where we could identify all of these. So we had some yarrow out there. We had the plantain. Um, we had the comfrey at the lodge um, before we got out on the trails. And so they could see in the wild each one of them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Get some of them going yourself or how to identify? Yeah. 
Uh huh. Um, most of them you're going to find in the spring and summer uh, type because right, like right now the plantains are gone. Um, the chickweed is definitely gone. The mullen is, is going to be like the first year it's the rosette, the second year it's the stalk, and then that's it. It's life. So those two-year cycles, yeah. So it depends on, on which one is which. Um, the comfrey, that's pretty much year-round. Uh, you can pick. You can also do things with the roots, um, with the comfrey as well. They're, they're more potent. They have more of the elantoin in it. And so for that reason, you would not ingest comfrey root. Anything you ingest, that would be the leaf, not the root. Have you ever bought any of these plants from Amazon? Have I ever bought any from Amazon? No, because I have a beautiful health food store that has a whole wall of dried herbs, and they have all of them. <laughs> I live at Weimar, but that's the health food store is in Auburn. In Auburn, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what else could you use besides vitamin E oil uh, for preservative? Yeah, not another oil so much, um, but like frankincense and lavender, I have heard, are, have some preservative uh, properties to it. So some essential oils um, can be used, but it's not going to preserve it as long as vitamin E would. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, the color of the yarrow doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does come in different colors. All right. So I think we're done. Thank you all. This was a lot of information for you to take in. <laughs> that was, um, but it was good to share with you. We're just going to close with a word of prayer. And then I'll take questions afterwards. All right? So let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this time that we have had together. I pray that you will be with each one that has been here and listening to all of this. Thank you that you've given us these natural, simple remedies and things that we can utilize. I pray that you will call things to their remembrance um, as they need and that they can be blessed with, with what you made. Lord, in ways that they've never even thought about before. And I just pray your blessing over each one of them, their, their family, their friends, their loved ones, that you would continue your work in and through each one to bring them uh, into your kingdom. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Any what? I don't know. No. What was your question, Carmen? Oils and herbs, what I use to 